Imagine a motorcycle engine smaller than a soda can screaming at 20,000 RPM. Now imagine that same engine pushing a bike to 118 miles per hour. This isn't science fiction. This actually happened in 1968 and it was so insane that racing officials banned it from competition forever. Picture this. It's 1967 at Suzuki's secret test facility in Japan. Engineers are huddled around what looks like a child's toy motorcycle. The bike is so small that grown men look ridiculous sitting on it. But when they fire up that tiny engine, the sound is unlike anything in motorcycling. A shriek so high-pitched that it makes your teeth hurt. The test rider clicks through six gears in rapid succession, tucking behind a bubble fairing barely larger than a dinner plate. The speedometer climbs past 100, past 110, finally touching 118 miles per hour. On a 50cc motorcycle, that's the same engine size as a modern moped that struggles to hit 30. This is the story of the Suzuki RK60, the most extreme small displacement racing motorcycle ever built, and the machine that forced international racing authorities to completely rewrite their rulebook. To understand why Suzuki built a 50cc bike capable of outrunning highway traffic, we need to travel back to the early 1960s. The Motorcycle Grand Prix World Championship had just added a 50cc class in 1962. For European manufacturers like MV Agosta and Kreidler, this was a novelty class, something to develop junior riders and entertain crowds between the real races. But for Japanese manufacturers, it was something else entirely. It was a proving ground. Honda had entered Grand Prix racing in 1959 with a clear mission, prove Japanese engineering on the world stage. Suzuki followed in 1960 and Yamaha joined the party in 1961. These companies weren't just racing for trophies, they were racing for legitimacy. Every victory helped sell motorcycles and export markets that still view Japanese products as cheap copies of European designs. The 50cc class became an engineering battleground because it had the fewest restrictions. While larger displacement classes limited the number of cylinders and gears, the 50cc rules were wide open. You could build whatever you wanted as long as it displaced no more than 49.9cc. The result? A technological arms race that defied all logic. In 1962, Suzuki's 50cc racer was a simple single-cylinder two-stroke making about 9 horsepower. By 1963, they developed a twin-cylinder version pushing 11 horsepower at 14,000 RPM. Honda responded with their own twin, making similar power, but revving even higher. The power outputs might sound laughable, but remember, these bikes weighed less than 100 pounds. The power to weight ratios were approaching superbike territory. Here's where it gets interesting. In 1966, Suzuki's engineers made a radical decision. Instead of continuing to refine their existing twin cylinder design, they would create something entirely new. The brief was simple, but insane. Build a 50cc motorcycle capable of competing with 120cc machines in terms of lap times. The budget, essentially unlimited. The timeline, one year. The engineering team, led by Masanao Shimizu, started with a blank sheet of paper. They knew that extracting more power from 50cc would require astronomical engine speeds. The existing twin was already pushing the limits at 17,000 RPM. To go further, they needed better cylinder filling, superior cooling, and reduced friction. The solution was elegant in its complexity. A square 4 configuration with two crankshafts geared together. Wait, let that sink in for a moment. They built a four-cylinder engine with a total displacement smaller than a shot glass. But Suzuki's engineers weren't done. They abandoned the square four for something even more extreme. A twin-cylinder design with bore and stroke dimensions that seemed impossible. The bore measured 33.5mm, the stroke was just 28mm. That's an over-square design so extreme that each piston was wider than it was tall. This configuration allowed the engine to rev beyond anything previously imagined for a 50cc motor. The heart of this beast was its engine internals. The crankshaft was a work of art, machined from solid billet steel and balanced to perfection. It had to be. At 20,000 RPM, the tiniest imbalance would tear the engine apart. The connecting rods were titanium, exotic material for the era and hellishly expensive. Each one cost more than a complete production motorcycle. The pistons were forged aluminum with a wall thickness of less than one mm. They weighed 28 grams each, about the same as five quarters. The engine used a rotary disc valve intake system, standard for two strokes but taken to an extreme. The intake timing was so radical that the engine was essentially unreadable, below 16,000 RPM. There was no power, no torque, just violent misfiring and fouled spark plugs. But once it hit that magic 16,000 RPM threshold, the power delivery was explosive. 
From 16,000 to 2,500 RPM, the engine produced a steady stream of power that seemed impossible from such a tiny displacement. Peak power was 17.5 horsepower at 2,500 RPM. Now here's the kicker, that's 357 horsepower per liter. To put that in perspective, a modern Formula 1 engine produces about 330 horsepower per liter. A current MotoGP bike makes about 280 horsepower per liter. This 50C two-stroke from 1967 had a higher specific output than anything racing today. The transmission was equally radical. Six speeds, all with straight cut gears for maximum efficiency. The ratios were so close that the rider never let the engine drop below 18,000 RPM once underway. First gear was good for 38 Eblutiri. Sixth gear, with tall gearing and a tailwind, could push the bike past 118 Kawanisimi. The gear changes had to be perfect. Miss a shift, let the revs drop, and you'd lost 5 seconds per lap trying to get back in the power band. The chassis was a masterpiece of minimalism. The frame was made from chrome moly, steel tubes with walls so thin you could dent them with your thumb. It weighed 8 pounds. The fuel tank held 7 liters and was formed from aluminum less than 0.5 mm thick. The front brake was a twin leading shoe drum measuring 120 Weimar across, tiny by modern standards but massive for a 50cc bike. The rear brake was almost ornamental, a 90 mm drum that was rarely used. The complete motorcycle, ready to race with fuel and oil, weighed 60 kilograms. That's 132 pounds, a modern 10-year-old child weighs more than this motorcycle. But the real genius of the RK60 SMN wasn't just its engine or chassis, it was the integration of everything into a package that actually worked. The aerodynamics were developed in collaboration with Japan's aerospace industry. The fairing was hand-formed fiberglass, shaped through hundreds of hours of testing. The rider adopted an extreme tucked position, chest on the tank, arms pulled in, helmet below the windscreen bubble. The frontal area was smaller than a pizza box. Cooling was critical. A two-stroke making this kind of specific output generated tremendous heat. The cylinder head featured elaborate finning with over 200 individual fins. The cylinder barrels had additional cooling fins machined at angles calculated to maximize airflow. Even the crankcases had cooling fins. In race conditions, cylinder head temperatures still reached 280 degrees Celsius. Pistons expanded so much that cold clearances had to be huge. Starting the engine when cold sounded like someone shaking a can full of rocks. The exhaust system was a symphony of expansion chamber physics. Two separate pipes, each hand formed from 0.8 meter steel sheet, tuned to provide maximum power at exactly 19,050 RPM. The expansion chambers were so precisely tuned that a one millibaker change in any dimension would cost half a horsepower. The pipes glowed cherry red during races, requiring special heat shielding to prevent burning the rider's legs. The fuel was equally exotic. While production bikes ran on pump gas, the RK67 demanded 103 octane racing fuel mixed with castor oil at a 20.1 ratio. The oil wasn't just for lubrication, it was critical for cooling and sealing the piston rings at those extreme RPMs. The smell of burnt castor oil became the bike's signature, a sweet acrid scent that old time racers still remember. So what was it like to actually ride this thing? Terrifying and exhilarating in equal measure, test rider Yoshimi Katayama described it as riding a very angry insect. Below 16,000 RPM the bike would barely move, the rider had to slip the clutch extensively just to get rolling. Once underway, keeping the engine in its narrow power band required total concentration. The tachometer, reading to 25,000 RPM, became the most important instrument. Let it drop below 18,000 and you'd get passed by 125s. Keep it above 19,500 and you'd rocket past everything. The sound was otherworldly. While four-stroke racing bikes produced a mechanical wail, the RK67 shrieked like nothing else on the track. At full speed, the exhaust note was actually painful without earplugs. Trackside spectators reported headaches after watching practice sessions. The frequency was so high that standard sound meters couldn't accurately measure it. The 1967 season was a development year. The bike showed promise, but suffered from reliability issues. Pistons seized, cranks broke, and the delicate engine internals required rebuilding after every race. But Suzuki's engineers persevered, methodically solving each problem. Stronger materials here, better cooling there, revised port timing to reduce stress. 
By 1968, the RK-67 was ready for battle. The bike dominated the Japanese Grand Prix at Suzuka, lapping the entire field except for second place. At the Dutch TT at Assen, it recorded the fastest trap speed of any 50cc machine, 118.2 subwoofer par on the long straight. Think about that, this bike with an engine smaller than most coffee cups was hitting speeds that would get you arrested on most highways. But here's where things went horribly wrong, or right, depending on your perspective. The FIM, Motorcycle Racing's governing body, watched the 50cc class with growing alarm. Costs were spiraling out of control. Suzuki estimated they spent over $2 million developing the RK67, roughly $15 million in today's money, for a 50cc racing bike. Honda's competing machine, the RC116, was equally expensive and complex. These weren't racing motorcycles anymore, they were rolling science experiments. The danger factor was escalating too. Riders on 50cc bikes were hitting speeds previously reserved for 500cc machines but with drums, brakes, and bicycle width tires. The bikes were so peaky that a missed shift could cause the rider to get rear-ended. Several serious accidents in 1968 raised red flags. At the end of 1968, the FIM dropped the hammer. New rules for 1969 limited 50cc bikes to single cylinders and six speeds maximum. The RK67 was instantly obsolete. Suzuki had spent millions developing the ultimate 50cc weapon, only to have it banned after a single season of competition. But wait, there's more. Honda had been developing their own answer to the RK67. The RC116 was a 50cc four-stroke twin that revved to 22,500 RPM. Yes, you read that right. A four-stroke hitting 22,500 RPM in 1968. It used gear-driven dual overhead cams, eight tiny valves, and made 14 horsepower. While less powerful than the Suzuki, it was even more complex. Each valve was smaller than a shirt button. The valve springs were wound from wire thinner than guitar strings. Honda claimed it could have been developed to match the Suzuki's power, but the rule change killed the project. Here's the thing about the RK67, it represented everything magnificent and absurd about 1960s racing. Engineers were given a simple displacement limit and told to go crazy. No cost caps, no development restrictions, no real safety requirements. Just pure engineering exploration pushed to its absolute limit. The technical innovations pioneered for these tiny bikes filtered into larger machines. The metallurgy, developed for those 20,000 RPM cranks, improved big bike reliability. The porting knowledge gained from making 350 horsepower per liter from a two-stroke advanced the entire industry. Even the aerodynamic research contributed to later developments in motorcycle design. Today, only three complete RK67 survive. One lives in Suzuki's museum in Japan, maintained in running condition, and occasionally fired up for special events. Hearing it run is a visceral experience, a sound from an era when engineers were artists and racing was about pushing boundaries regardless of cost or practicality. Modern 50cc bikes are limited to single cylinders, restricted exhausts, and in many countries, electronically, limited to 30 melwikowitschen. They're transportation tools, not technological showcases. The spirit of unlimited development that created the RK67 is gone, replaced by spec racing and cost controls. Probably for the best, but something magical was lost. The fastest 50cc motorcycle ever built wasn't just about speed, it was about what happens when you remove limitations and ask engineers to dream. The RK67 proved that displacement doesn't determine performance, engineering does. In an era of increasingly strict regulations and homogenized racing, it stands as a monument to pure technical ambition. No 50cc motorcycle will ever go 118 hyperumper again. The rules won't allow it, economics don't support it, and honestly, it's probably too dangerous anyway. But for one brief moment in 1968, a tiny motorcycle with an engine smaller than a coffee cup could outrun traffic on the Autobahn. That's not just engineering, that's magic. So what's the most insane racing machine you've ever seen in person? Drop a comment below and share your story. If you enjoyed this deep dive into racing history, make sure to subscribe because we're just getting started exploring the wildest machines ever built. Until next time, keep those engines screaming.